Colossians chapter 2. I'm going to talk to you today on the most important foundational subject we have in the Christ life. It's a subject that if people don't get a hold of it in some way during their walk, they won't stay in in Christ position. They'll move on to something else. So the key to our continuance in Christ, our life, is in this foundational study. And so I ask that you give very special attention to what I have to say today and especially go with me into the scriptures that we're going to deal with. If you are an outsider in this world today and you pick up the Bible, you're going to read a book that seems to be a story of one failure after another. Now, there are a lot of miracles. There are unbelievable miracles from Genesis 1 all the way through. Creative miracles, healing miracles, worldwide miracles, just one great miracle after another. But somehow, everything that is miraculous in the Bible is swallowed up by the failures that are there. For instance, God had two people, only two people he had to deal with, and he told them exactly what to do, and they disobeyed him and sent the whole of God's plan into sin. Think about that. Everybody that would come after Adam and Eve would be sinners because of their sin as our forefathers in the flesh. On through the Bible, we have story after story. Next, it's the story of Cain and Abel and the failure they had in getting along with one another. And then you come up to the antediluvian age and you have Noah. Noah could have started a whole new world just like God wanted. Only eight people, they were all family members and we could have had a brand new world through Noah. But instead of Noah obeying God, he failed. And from Noah we go into Abraham. The whole of God's plan was to center in Abraham having a just heir produced by Sarah, 90 years old, and Abraham 100. But instead, they took matters into their own hands, failed God, presented a false heir who to this day is a great enemy to God's plan. A failure. Then he called Moses, the greatest prophet in the Bible. But Moses disobeyed him, and God finally had to take him one day up on a mountain and bury him. All the way through the scripture, you see the great failure of God. David, a man after God's own heart. After God's own heart, like an under God in his feelings. Sin, committed adultery, killed a man. After he'd written most all those psalms and everything he'd done. Failure. And then you get to the children of Israel. And if you want to read the record of failure in human beings, it's there in Israel. They had one miracle after another and still failed God. They never did come to be what God intended that they be. And then as a last resort to straighten out these people that had lived on the earth these centuries, he sent his own son. He sent his own son to these people to be their king. And you know what they did? He came to his own and his own received him not and they killed him. So all the way through the scriptures for the first 4,000 years from Adam to the cross we have nothing but failure. A lot of great miracles took place but they're overwhelmed by the failure because what it was God wanted he didn't get. There are five dispensations in that 4,000 year period. Five different times God started a new message and every time the message was rejected and ended in failure. So now what is God to do? How is it that God shall ever bind up the broken 
and make a way where there seems to be no way. If we looked at it just from a carnal viewpoint, we would see nothing but failure. But an interesting thing was taking place all the time this seeming failure was going on. A big thing was taking place. It was in the mind of God. Because in the mind of God, we have two scriptures that tell us what was bigger than the failure. What was bigger than the miracles he sent that didn't straighten out people? What was bigger? You go to Romans chapter 16. I want you to mark it if you will. Romans chapter, chapter 16. Verse 25. Now to him that is of the power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began. Draw a circle around the word secret because that's the theme of this message. It was kept secret. God had something in his mind he never told anybody from the beginning of the world up until the New Testament. And then there's one other verse we need to mark and it's in Ephesians, the third chapter. Ephesians 3 and verse 9. And to make all men see what is the fellowship of the mystery, which from the beginning of the world hath been hid in God, who created all things by Jesus Christ. Well, everything that took place on this earth, from Adam to Jesus hanging on the cross, fit into God's plan fit into his plan perfectly because all of these things must take place before he will ever release the secret that's in his mind. He has a secret. Before he created this world, he had a secret. Something was hidden in God. And so when Adam and Eve sinned and it looked like failure, God had a secret, not yet ready to be released. When Abraham and Moses sinned, God had a secret. When Noah sinned, God had a secret. When Israel sinned, God had a secret. He always had a thing in his mind that was going to be the difference. What was it God didn't get out of humanity? He didn't get people who loved him. All these people I have mentioned all who failed God at one time or another in their life are people who did not love God. Adam and Eve didn't love God. Abraham and Sarah loved themselves. They were self-righteous, wanting to do something to help God. Noah was self-righteous. He wanted to do something to help God. But all of this time, God didn't get a lover. There wasn't anybody that loved him. And even when he started dealing with Israel and gave them... Great numbers of miracles, just thousands of miracles took place in the 1,700 years of God dealing with Israel. But you know what? She never loved him. God even called Israel his wife. He was finally forced to say she was backslidden. She wasn't true to him. She didn't love him. And so all God ever wanted was somebody to love him. In 4,000 years of what is failure on the natural side, on the spiritual side, God never fails. But on the natural side, the 4,000 years of failure in God's plan, the five dispensations and their message that never took hold among the people of that day, God had something in his mind that he knew must be done. What was this thing that he was going to do? He was going to finally fix humanity so they loved him. He's going to have a people who loved him. Now, how is he going to get a people who loved him? How in this world can God ever get people who love him? He could create them, 
to love him, but they'd be robots. He doesn't want a robot. Just like God loves us regardless of what we do or who we are, God wanted us to love him regardless. So he couldn't make us robots. He couldn't create us to love him. What he had to do was to fix us so that the love he gave to us was reciprocal. It would return back to him. The love would go back to him. That's what he had in his mind. He took 4,000 years of human destiny to prove that humans within themselves as free moral agents would not love him regardless. They'd love him sometimes. They'd love him when they needed something. They'd love him when he blessed them. They'd love him when everything was going good. But when the circumstances and the situation set in, their love waned. And very often they did a selfish thing. They did what was natural to them and not what was natural to God. So God knew after that 4,000 years that sooner or later he was going to have to do something to humanity to cause them to love him. Jesus of Nazareth said to Nicodemus one day, you must be born again. That's the first sign or semblance we have in the whole of this book, the first sign that ever says how God's going to solve the problem with humanity. Now he's created all humans in his image and likeness. They all have been created in his image and likeness, but because they have willful minds, because they have untrained souls, they end up doing their own thing. So now God has a plan. At some juncture in his plan, he's going to change the human so that he gets love out of him. What's that juncture? What's that one point that causes him to do this? It's when his son hangs on the cross. It's Calvary. Calvary. That's where the father says the work will be finished. At Calvary, I will get what I've needed for 4,000 years of Bible time. I'll get it at Calvary. And so Jesus dies. What's the result of Christ's death? The result of Christ's death is very simple. He releases the secret. Now, get my wording here. God released the secret and it went to work. How did it go to work? It went to work on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came. When the Holy Spirit came, the Holy Spirit then took every soul that he was in and he introduced them to Christ as their life. The Holy Spirit came and brought with him the seed and the seed would be the means by which they would be born again. And when born again, the secret of God would be in place. Now try to fix it in your mind. The plan of God ultimately and finally hinged on a seed that came by a rebirthing. It was released at that time, but it was not known at that time. Nobody knew it. Multitudes of people had the seed in them and didn't know what it meant. Didn't know. They still lived according to their old knowledge. They lived according to the knowledge of good and evil. They lived according to Judaistic doctrine and Moses' law. They didn't know what that was that was in them. Though it was released, that was God's grace. Grace began when God gave to man everything they needed as a result of the cross. But he didn't tell them. The secret was at work, but the secret was not known. It was some 13 years or so after Jesus died on the cross before God ever began to make the secret known. He needed somebody who would take that great secret by which he had ruled the world and had kept the world intact 
and make it known. What was very obvious was that he needed somebody that had the backbone and the stamina to do something that would change the whole course of God's dealings for 4,000 years. That would be an artist's task. That would be almost impossible because he would need somebody who could take everything that was in this book and set it aside in people's minds and tell them a whole new truth. For that new man was Paul. The apostle Paul was one raised up by God who would now preach this truth. The apostle Paul preached what Jesus said to Nicodemus would happen. You must be born again. But the Apostle Paul never used the term born again. He never uses it anywhere in his writings. But he has another term he uses for it. It's called a mystery. A great mystery. Now God's going to take humans that he has already created in his image and likeness and put a new life in them. How will man ever understand that? He's going to take this creature he's created and not just put a new life in them, but put Christ in them, his only begotten son. His spirit will be joined to their spirit. How will they ever understand that? So Paul begins by saying, they're not going to understand it. It's a mystery. It's a great mystery. And unless this mystery is understood, People will never come to the knowledge of it. They'll never come to the knowledge of it. So the mystery is given to the Apostle Paul and to him alone. Why does he call it a mystery? Because this must be revealed to people. This is not the same old, same old out of the Old Testament. This is not the teaching of Jesus of Nazareth. This mystery is going to create a whole new and different group of people. This mystery is going to be a gospel that is not pinpointed anywhere in the scriptures before Paul receives it. It is not prophesied. It is not talked about. Though the death of Jesus has over a thousand prophecies in the Old Testament leading to it, there's not one prophecy that leads to the mystery. It was hid in God. It was something God was going to do in time. The time had come starting on the day of Pentecost. Well, why did God do this thing? He did this because of the failure of Israel. In Acts 28:28, you need to mark this scripture, if you will. You need to know this scripture. You'll never go on in the understanding of Bible truth if you don't have this scripture being a guideline for you. In Acts 28, beginning at 20, verse 27, it says, For the heart of this people is wax gross, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed, and lest they see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I should heal them. I want to stop right there. He's talking about Israel. He's saying that Israel is deaf, dumb, and blind. She has rejected God on every turn and does not love God and now has killed his son. And he said, just in case that some Israelite believes and thinks they're converted or is sick and thinks I'll heal them, be it known, verse 28, Be it known therefore unto you that the salvation of God is sent unto the Gentiles, and they'll hear it. What did he do there? He stopped. He set aside. He didn't destroy. He set aside all of the gospel that belonged to Israel, all that was in Judaism. He set it aside. It's set aside now. That's why God is silent on this earth. That's why God's not stopping wars. That's why God's not 
changing nations. That's why things are not happening like they happened in the Old Testament because God is silent. He set aside his people called Israel whom he works through on this earth. And when he set aside Israel, he raised up a new group of people called Gentiles who had never had a gospel. They never before had a gospel. And their sin has been to try to claim the gospel that belonged to Israel when God was ready to give them a brand new gospel called grace. So what Gentiles have done ever since the day of Pentecost is try to latch on to Israel's blessings. Try to be what Israel was to be. Many preach today that the church has taken over from Israel and is doing the things that God expected Israel to do. That's heresy. That's an untruth. God raised up a new group of people who had no past. There's not any prophecies for Gentiles in the Old Testament. It's a whole new group of people who now have a new and different gospel called grace. The secret was released in the new gospel. The new gospel brought forth this thing that was hidden in God. For God always had this desire that I will have my own family. Now Paul called this a mystery. This mystery is the foundation stone, if you want to say, for Christianity. The great mystery which is Christ in you, Colossians 1, 27, 26 and 27. The mystery is Christ in you, the hope of glory. And that's the foundation stone for Christianity. Nobody in Christianity ever becomes a thorough Christian without the knowledge of the mystery. The mystery is the way God raised up another people. What is he doing there? He's going to put the only lover he ever trusted inside human beings. He's going to get reciprocating love. He's not going to trust humanity anymore to love him. He's not going to trust men to do right anymore. Look, the greatest failed. Nations failed. Israel failed. He's not going to trust them anymore. He's going to take his own son like a seed and put it inside this creature that he's created in his image and likeness and he's going to make that the creature's life. So now, God has in the creature somebody that loves him. You see, your love isn't worth a nickel. You as Christians can't really love within yourself. Quit trying. You'll fail. That's why marriages break. The love is not Christ's love. That's why homes are devastated, children go wrong. The love was not Christ's love. I had a woman tell me the other day, I loved those children. I just overly loved them. I said, don't matter. If it isn't Christ's love out of you, it won't change them. So now, the great mystery is Christ in you. Why did God do that? So he could have a people that was likened unto himself. Israel has never been likened unto himself. Nobody in the Old Testament was likened unto God. Nobody there really fell in love with God. We might make an exception with Enoch. I don't know his case, but God took him. Might make an exception with Elijah, who was caught up to meet the Lord. I don't know. Maybe they were perfect. But I know most were not. And I know now that the only perfect love there is for God is by the Christ that is in us. As Paul said in 1 Corinthians 1 and 30, Christ has been made unto us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. Most of all, he was made unto us love. So the basis, the foundation for everything in Christianity is in this mystery. 
The word mystery is mentioned 21 times in Paul's epistles, so it's a big thing. 21 times in Paul's epistles. And all the way through the epistles, the cry is to learn and to know the mystery. In Romans chapter 11, verse 25, Paul says, For I would not, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own conceits, that blindness that is in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles come in. What did he say to Israel? Brethren, you should not be ignorant of this mystery. What has happened? Through the ages, the mystery has been discarded, not preached, not taught. The scriptures have been changed in Bible after Bible, and the great mystery, which is the foundation stone of Christianity, has been ignored. Literally been ignored. Paul uses the term mystery in place of the term born again. Now, we sit and discuss how it is that most people that we ask, are you born again, say yes, and we know they don't know what it means. Why is it they don't know what it means? It's because the great mystery miracle is taken out of it. That's why when Nicodemus said, do I go back into the mother's womb a second time, and Jesus went far off talking about how the wind blows. Why did he do that? Because the mystery must be revealed. That's why Paul called it a mystery instead of being born again. So the next time you talk to somebody about being born again, take them into the mystery. It's mentioned 21 times. Being born again is only mentioned three or four times at the most in the whole of the scriptures. And it's not understood by people. They just claim it's something they have. But the mystery is Christ in you, which takes away your responsibility to be something pleasing unto God yourself. And that's what God wanted. He never had people who pleased him. He never had people who lived for him. He never had people who loved him. How is he going to change that? He's going to have to take the one that pleases him and put him on the inside of us. Christ in us. Christ in us. So Paul uses this word for several reasons. First, he uses this word because it's based on revelation. Revelation. Paul comes saying that now that grace has been bestowed upon all who believe, their problem is not getting something from God. Their problem is knowing what they got. Knowing what they got. You see, Israel got one miracle after another from opening up of the Red Sea all the way to the man in the wilderness, all the way to the walls of the city being broken down in Canaan's land. She just got one blessing, one miracle after another. But she never had a mind change. Her mind was never changed. So the blessings meant little to her. Now, the Apostle Paul has given us a term that says this must be revealed to you. These things don't come by your senses, Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2. <coughs> These things come only by the revelation of the Holy Spirit. And he uses that all the way through the scriptures. He says the problem with Christians is not getting something from God. Their problem is knowing what they already have. So Get the mind of God. You have available the mind of God. Be not taken up with the world, but be renewed in your mind. Again and again, he comes back to knowledge in the mind. Because it's just that important. So the basis of Christianity is in this mystery. It's not in your works. It's not in your goodness. It's not in you at all. It's in Christ. So we have this vibrant verse in Romans 8, uh, Galatians 2, 20, where Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. I don't live anymore. 
but I do live. Yet it is not I that live. It's Christ who lives in me. Don't you see? That's the whole basis of Christianity. Christians are not Baptist. Christians are not Methodist. Baptists are not Christians. Catholics are not Christians. What is a Christian? A Christian is one who has the foundation of Christ in them. And a lot of Christians are Baptists. A lot of Christians are Methodists. A lot of Christians are Catholic. But we need to get the thing turned around. A Christian is not a Baptist. But Baptists can be Christians. You understand the difference there? But look at it in your own life. You join a church, you get saved, you water baptize, you go through all of this, and you think, now I'm a Christian. No, you're not a Christian. Christ is the Christian. That's what he's getting at. That's why it must be revealed. That's why we teach in the Christ life, the change didn't come to you. The change is an exchange of nature, not a change in you. No change in you. God, by judgment and by law, tried to change people for 4,000 years of the Old Testament. He gave up. Christ on the cross nailed every one of those laws to the cross because they were not effective. What is effective? Another life in you. That's what you need. You need to be born again. So Paul called it a mystery. This word mystery refers to this hidden work of God which was in God's mind before time started. In the Bible, there are only two things that are ever mentioned that was in God's mind before time started. One of them is Ephesians 1 and 4, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world. And the other is 1 Peter 1 and 20, the lamb slain before the foundation of the world. But you see how these two are wrapped together? The cross is where God is able to work it out. What he worked out was the mystery. He worked the mystery out, praise God. Paul used the term to explain to us how Christ returns to this earth through the in Christ position. In 1 Corinthians 12 and 13, we have the vibrant verse that says, for by one spirit, the Holy Spirit, are we all placed in one body, which is Christ. He introduces a new body to us. We are all in a new body. In this body of mine, it's merely a container for Christ, who body I have been joined to. I have been joined to the body of Christ. And so it is with you. Paul used the term... To fix humanity so that they understood what it was God was doing. He called it a mystery. Theologians think they know what God's doing. But without a revelation of Christ as the life of the human, they still don't know what God is doing. Bible teachers and preachers today think they know what God is doing. But not without the emphasis on the revelation of the mystery. The mystery is what God is really doing that makes the great difference. I want to say three or four things about the mystery. One of them is that in Paul's ministry, the mystery shut him off from all other beliefs, from all other fellowships. The mystery shut him off. Now, if he had added the mystery on to Judaism, they would have accepted him. But the minute Paul said that the preaching of the gospel is the revelation of the mystery, Romans 16, 25, that shut him off. He couldn't get along with the other apostles he couldn't get along with the other disciples. Their ministries would not be intertwined together. A radical decision was made in Galatians 2 where Peter, the great preacher for the kingdom, said, God called me to preach circumcision. That self works. 
Paul said, okay, God called me to preach non-circumcision. You can do no work to please God. Right there, there was a separation. What was the separation? It was Christ in you. Peter was still by his own effort believing the old Jewish custom of circumcision. That everybody that got saved had to be circumcised. Everybody that got saved had to go through all of the rigmarole that was attached to Judaism. No. Paul said, you preach that if you feel led of God to do it, but I preach that none of that is necessary. So what did the mystery do? The mystery separated Paul's work from all others. Did you know there were probably hundreds of different Gospels that sprang up after Jesus died? These Gospels, different ones, came from followers of Jesus. 5,000 men sitting on a hillside one day to receive the loaves and fishes. Think of how many of them must have become Bible teachers or preachers or students or something, and they all came up with their own ideas. History tells us there were hundreds of different ideas that were erroneous in the days of Paul. God gave him one singular message on the mystery. That the mystery Christ in you is your hope of glory and nothing else. Nothing else works. So the Apostle Paul didn't have fellowship with others. Another thing happened. When you don't join with others who are called Christians, you get persecuted. See? You get persecuted. You can't, you, you can't do it. I had a fellow talk to the other day who said, I've been listening to Christian radio, and he said, you know what? I'm having to turn off every program. He said, none of them have the basic truth. They all have self-interest messages. Come to our church and get what we got. Believe our doctrine and you'll be saved. None of them teach the word. And I told you about a grandma maybe. Some time ago she went with her grandchildren to the old church she used to go to. And the preacher was only raising money but he was so heavily laden with law that it upset her, and she got up and walked out of the service, upset her grandchildren. They came to her later and said, Grandma, why would you do that? She said, it's simple, I can't take it anymore. Well, that'll bring persecution. But how could she make a greater impact on her children than to let them know there's a difference between law and grace? Wonderful thing happened when Dexter Bird was near death. Just a few days before he died, he brought in his children and his grandchildren and set them around them, and he gave them a message. And the message was, if you ever leave the Christ life, you're a fool. Blunt. But he said, if you ever leave it, you're a fool. That's what the mystery does. Does a mystery make us better than anybody else? No, because everybody else has Christ in them too. It's the difference in knowing that. Am I to be punished because I know that? Paul was killed because he knew something the rest of them didn't know and weren't interested in listening to. Paul went over to Jerusalem two times. The church at Jerusalem was a great church. They say there were tens of thousands of people that belonged to that big church. Pentecostal church in Jerusalem. It was all Pentecostal, springing out of the day of Pentecost where they talked in tongues and so forth. But you know, while Paul went over there, they never asked him to speak one time. You'd think they'd let this man who was out winning souls and changing lives more than anybody in that day, they'd let him say something. But no, he was contrary to their self-interest and their self-righteousness. They wouldn't let him. So you know what he did? The last time he went over there, he just went down on the streets of Jerusalem, did what he did anywhere else, and started preaching on the street corner. And it made the people so mad, a riot took place, that the law had to come in and separate him and get him out of town. 
Not going to stop a man that's got a message burning in him. Yes, the message will bring persecution. This message will bring persecution. Somebody says to me, why aren't we reaching more people? We're persecuted and we do it. We don't want to be hurt. <coughs> That's it. We don't want to be hurt. Most of our people not even going to tell their family that Jesus lives in me because they won't understand it, so no use me saying it. But the basis of Christianity is Christ in you. Remember, Peter's group of circumcision are never called Christians in the scripture. The great first church in Jerusalem that was Pentecostal is never called Christians. They were first called Christians at Antioch. There was a Pentecostal church, big Pentecostal church, but they weren't called Christians. They were people in the way or out of the way, in the way, believed the way. <laughs> The mystery is not like any other doctrines. Why is it not like Judaism? Why isn't the mystery based on the other five dispensations? Why isn't it based on Daniel's prophecies? Why isn't it based on Isaiah's prophecies? It's simple. It's different because it belongs to a different group of people. It belongs to the Gentiles. Gentiles. You see, the Gentiles have no past, so we have no prophecies. We have nothing about us in the Old Testament. We don't have one person in the Old Testament that's our leader or our example in any way until Israel is set aside, the Gentiles had no gospel. So the mystery is not like any other doctrine. It's not like any other message that's in the whole of the scriptures. It is different. You who are writing notes down, I'm going to give you some of the scriptures. I'm, I, I can't remember just exactly how many definite scriptures are. It's mentioned 21 times, but uh, write down Ephesians chapter 3, verses 3, 4, and 9. Write down Colossians chapter 1, verse 26 to verse 29. I've already got you turned to Colossians 2 and 2. We're going to go there in a minute. And Colossians 4 and 3. Search these scriptures out and see what is in this tremendous truth of Christ in us, the hope of glory. Now I want to go to Colossians 2 and start at verse 1. You got it? You need to read this with me because it's that important. For I would that you knew what great conflict I have for you. In other words, he said, I have constant burden. I have conflict in my thinking because I'm always thinking about you. And for them at Laodicea and for as many as have not seen my face in the flesh. Now this is a precious verse because there are three groups of people he's talking to here. He's talking to the folks at Coloss. He's talking to the folks at Laodicea. And he's talking to those who have never seen his face, and that takes you and I in. We've never seen the face of the Apostle Paul, so this is written to us. Notice what he says now. I have great conflict that the people in these places, Coloss, Laodicea, and those that have not seen my face, in the flesh, that their hearts might be comforted, being knit together in love unto all riches of the full assurance of understanding, to the acknowledgement of the mystery of God and of the Father and of Christ, in whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Four things in this verse that are important to us. First, he says that your hearts might be comforted. There's something wrong with us. In America, Christians, something wrong because our hearts are seldom ever comforted. We're upset about everything that takes place. 
Christian after Christian lives off of pills because they're nervous and upset. We're not comforted. We don't understand what that means. We don't know that that was a part of grace that was given to us. Maybe you think it's a part of grace already. But what you don't know is that your heart cannot be comforted if you do not have the knowledge of the mystery. We're in verses that are going to say this now. First thing you don't have is comfort. Why are Christians all excited and upset over the situation in our world today? There's no comfort for them. They're like all the rest of the world. They're out worrying about how I'm going to make it. What am I going to do? And I think there's a place where if evil comes that we do what we can to protect ourselves and our family from it. Somebody said, would you go to war? Yes. I was called to. I'd go to war to protect my country and my family. But I don't lose my comfort or my faith in God. I don't lose that. Whatever happens, I can't forfeit that because my life isn't based as it was before on what happens outside of me. My life is based on this foundation stone <clears throat> Christ in me. That's my life. My life is not one of worry. My life is not one of fretting. My life is not one that I need somebody to lay hands on me and pray that I'll be comforted. No. I am comforted by the mystery. By Christ in me. That's where my comfort is. See, that's a different gospel. Look at the next thing it says here. It says that we would be knit together in love. That we'd be knit together in love. What does that mean? That means that our life that has so many different pulls on it. You got one strand over here, husband and wife relationship. You got another strand over here, job. You got another strand over here, <coughs> health. You got another strand over here, grandkids. You got another strand over here, the Lord and His work. We got all of these strands of life. We're not one thing, we're a whole bunch of things. But he says if the foundation has been laid in the mystery, you are knit together in love. What does that mean? That means that love is strong enough to pull all of these different cords of life together and make them one thing. A strong cord. Love. Knit together in love. You see, <clears throat> we are given to the separation of all these things. We get into a deep situation. We say, well, I don't care what any of us think. I've got to take care of my job. You're not knit in love. Somebody says, well, I just don't have time for these people's problem over here. I've got problems of my own. That's not knit together in love. You've got a lot of different cords of life flowing out of you. But the mystery knits it all together in love. The first time God ever had love returned to him properly was when people were born again. Why? They had the seed in them. They had the God seed in them. And that was Christ returning the love to God. That's why they all failed in the past. They didn't really love God. I failed too. But I thank God my spirit never fails. That's Christ. Christ in me. He's joined to my spirit. I fail him in soul and body. I'm not perfect there, but I'm perfect in spirit. I can't fail him there. That's where true love comes out of me. He finally found a vessel he could put his son in. I accepted him. I don't always exemplify it. But to God, it is always there. When he sees me, he sees Christ. He sees that love in me. That's the mystery. Third thing's in this verse. 
he says, that would have all the riches from understanding. All the riches from understanding. There are two other verses where the word mystery is used that use the same term. All riches. I never put those together until here recently. All riches. Somebody comes to me and they say, uh, why aren't you uh, healing the sick anymore? Why aren't you casting out devils? Why aren't you praying for people to prosper and get ahead? I already have all riches. All riches are mine. All riches are yours because you have a new foundation, not a foundation that's based on your need. Thank you, I would have never heard that. We have, a, we have a whole new and different foundation, not one that's based on your need, but one that's based on Christ in you. There's been a change. There's been a change. All riches, all things are yours. His grace is sufficient. Those are our promises, not new ministries that I must go to this person and heal them. I must go there and do this or that. Grace is a whole different understanding of our relationship to God. It's based on the mystery. Based on, it's based on Christ in us. That's our hope. Our only hope of glory. All the riches from understanding. We'll get back on this subject in just a moment. But I want to go to the fourth point in this Second verse of Colossians 2, it says, to the knowledge of the mystery. Now we're going to hit the nail on the head. You already have Christ in you. <coughs> but you don't see the mystery because the mystery must be revealed. I don't know how the mystery is revealed. I used to teach you on how to get a revelation of Christ. I don't do it anymore because I've heard of people receiving it through so many different ways. Some people instantly, some people took 10 years, some people never. But the revelation of the mystery is the key to Christian living. To the acknowledgement of the mystery. What do you acknowledge in the mystery? Christ lives in me. What does that mean? I'm not necessary. I'm an unnecessary thing. I no longer live. Christ lives in me. So if the mystery is Christ in you, your hope of glory, then I've got to do something about my soul and body. I've got to bring them under subjection to this Christ that lives in me. Not easy to do. But it can be done. You see, a great change took place when the gospel went to the Gentiles. It was a new, living, vibrant gospel. The Apostle Paul had to present a whole new message to the world. That's why he preaches nothing out of the Old Testament. He preaches nothing from Jesus of Nazareth other than his death, burial, and resurrection. All in Christ's positions. Because it all hinges on the mystery. The mystery is Christ in us. The mystery is us in Christ. That's what Christianity is based on. And the understanding of that is what makes a Christian. But let's talk about growth. The Apostle Paul was saved on the road to Damascus. When he was saved, he didn't know the mystery. That was a word never to be in his vocabulary from the past. He didn't know the mystery. We're not for sure, but we assume that about three years went by from the time he was saved, met Christ on the road to Damascus, and the time he was sent by the Spirit into the Arabian desert. Three years. What did he do during those three years? He didn't know anything about following Jesus. 
He was an enemy of Christ. He was a killer of those who did follow Jesus. His record was bad. Meanest man on earth. What's he going to do? He's met Christ, and Christ has said, it shall be told you what you shall do. Well, where was the first place he went? Well, he went over there to a man's house on, what was it, Straight Street? To Ananias. And who was Ananias? I don't know for sure who he was, but I rather imagine that Ananias might have been in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. Or maybe Ananias was in the 3,000 saved that day. Or a few days later when 5,000 was saved. Maybe he was one of those. I don't know. I imagine he was in the upper room with 120. Because you know what he did with Paul? He laid hands on him. And he prayed that his blindness would go away. And it went away. He laid hands on him. And he received the Holy Spirit, per se, and spoke in tongues. He made a Pentecostal out of him. Paul was following the leading of the Spirit. And so you know, for about three years, Paul was involved with and mixed up with Pentecostal people. People that had been there on the day of Pentecost. That's why a lot of people have a problem with Paul. They have a problem with Paul. I say you need to follow Paul as he followed Christ. And so people come to me, Pentecostal people come to me and say, well, I follow Paul as he followed Christ. Look, he preached the gifts of the Spirit and he said, I thank God I talk in tongues more than you all. So he was a Pentecostal. Yes, that's right. So they say, we follow Paul. A good Baptist comes along and he takes another thing. He says, I follow Paul because Paul baptized some people in water. Yep, you're right. He says he did. Don't know exactly how many. It was less than 20. But he baptized some people in water. So they say, well, can't we follow Paul? I said, yeah, just don't stop there. That's what happened in the first years of his life. <clears throat> And so he writes about it. But I says, once he had the revelation of Christ as his life, you know what? All of that passed away. The mystery had come. He didn't know the mystery before then. He had to grow in this grace. He didn't have the mystery. So, let's go over and read 1 Corinthians 13. Now I want you to see that we're talking about a man here who has a whole new gospel. He doesn't know that gospel for the first few years of his ministry. But when he has a revelation of Christ, he comes to that gospel. 1 Corinthians 13, beginning to read at verse 8. Listen to what it says. Charity Love never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. Oh, something's happened to him. Here's a fellow who in the previous chapter is laying out how the, how the gifts of the Spirit operate. Twelve gifts of the Spirit. Here's how they operate. Nine gifts of the Spirit. What is it? Nine. And then he goes over in the next chapter and he says how they're supposed to operate in the church. But wait a minute. Something's happened to him. Something's happened to him. What happened to him? He learned something. He got something directly from Jesus Christ. Notice what he says. For we know in part, and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away with. Aha! What is in part? The outer ministries are only in part. I don't care who it is and where you find them. Their ministry, if it does not, if it's not based on the mystery, is in part. 
They don't have it all. That's why healers pray for a few and they get blessed. They only have it in part. That's why people, when they prophesy, very few of them take take place. Uh, nine out of ten prophecies in Pentecostals is that a great revival is coming, has yet to come. They prophesy in part. Paul's not making fun of them. He's saying they only have it in part. Then what is in part? What's in part is what you do. Your ministry is in part. It's not whole. I don't care how great you are, how famous you are, how powerful you are, how much faith you have. Your ministry is only in part. Now he explains that. When I was a child, I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. Ah, what is a little kid? They got to have what they want or they're not happy. That's a child. He's talking about these believers who had to have their gifts. They were arguing and fussing over them at the church of Corinth. So he said, they're children, and they've got to put away these childish things. But he's kind to them. He says, now, now, I've been in this, Paul says. I was mixed up with Ananias. He, he laid hands on me and baptized me and all that. He said, now we see through a glass darkly. But he said, the day's going to come when we see Christ face to face. He said, now I know in part, but that day will come when I'll know even as also I am known. Who are you, Paul? I'm a Christian. The day will come that I'll understand that. Christians are based on the mystery, Christ in I went through all these things. When I came to the knowledge that Christ was my life, I had to do something about my healing ministry. I had to do something about my casting out of devils ministry. I wrote books on all these things. I had to do something about telling everybody if they served God, they'd be rich. That was a lie. It didn't work. I began to see there was a whole new program. There was a whole new life. It was Christ alive in us, not me alive by my ministry. I had to come to that. It hurt. Because it took away my self-identity. Took away who I thought I was. But Paul said you have to put away childish things. And you have to begin to see things clearly. Where do you see them clearly? In, this, in these epistles. The group that on the day of Pentecost all had Christ put in them and they didn't know it. They were still exercising the old Judaistic message that Jesus gave back in the Gospels. But the day came they had to put aside these things. Now, I'm going to tell you something. I'm not in the healing ministry anymore. But in our fellowship, I pray for and minister to sick people, and I see as many people healed today as I did before. Why? I'm not the healer. Jesus is. Jesus is. If I come across the devil, I take authority over him in Jesus' name by Jesus' power. Not me anymore. It's him. But I don't have to do that unless the Spirit leads me. These are ministries that make men something. Not Christ. Christ in you is the ministry. Christ in you is the gifted one. Christ in you is the apostle, prophet, pastor, teacher, and evangelist. You don't have to seek to be those things. You have Christ in you and you are those things. And the Holy Spirit can choose you at different times and places to exercise some of those ministries. Some of you have felt that. that you've had an experience with somebody where I just felt out of this world. I never knew I'd say and do those things. That's, that's the Holy Spirit bringing forth Christ in you. 
that's what he intended every one of us to be. But instead, we don't have the foundation of the mystery, and so we got a few running around saying we're apostles, or we're prophets, or we're, we're this, we're that. And so the gospel is lost. Once again, the gospel is lost. So I minister to people, all that are in need, but it's not me no more. It's not I. It's Christ as me. It's Christ as me. And he wants to operate as Christ as you. Let him. Let him.